to um, Paul for that kind introduction. Thank you all for coming along the relatively early evening slot. It's a great pleasure uh, to be invited to uh, deliver tonight's lecture here in Burlington House. And as a fellow of the Society of Antichrists called its home, it's only right that I'm going to be talking about the value of arts and humanities both to universities and contemporary society. And actually, the last time I spoke here at this building was in 2013 when I launched my uh, book, Bosworth, The Birth of the, the Tudors, and I'm delighted to be back. And uh, as many of you know, as Paul alluded to, um, I've attempted to try and achieve a work-life balance that involves juggling policy and public service with a personal passion for exploring the past and continuing my best possible, uh, particularly with three and four-year-old children now, to, to continue to write history. And I continue to do so not for any financial reward or material gain, but because, like many of you here this evening, um, I'm drawn by that overwhelming desire to understand, to comprehend how different, indeed how similar, previous generations are to our own, and to understand them simply on their own terms, for their own sake. And it's not something, I believe, that can ever be fully measured or its value codified by some anonymized data collection processor. Indeed, my own graduate outcome data was only salvaged at the last moment when the final week before I turned uh, 29, that sort of fateful age which is measured in the longitudinal education outcomes data, to my surprise, I was suddenly elected uh, as Member of Parliament to Marshall seat of Kingswood, my home. Now that brought a sudden end to any hopes I might have had of my first uh, career choice uh, uh, path, which was a uh, dream back of entering academia. But hold my hand up, I uh, must admit to feeling rather guilty being in the presence of the AHRC uh, this evening. And I first wanted to take this opportunity of getting something off my chest, uh, namely to say thank you uh, for the support the council gave me as a master's and doctoral student in the early 2000s. I only apologise sincerely that I never finished the deep goal that I was funded for. Now I hope I can be forgiven, but I wanted to say, however, that what I learned then uh, and the skills that I acquired, the knowledge and research that I began, I hope did not go to waste. Indeed, while I can't account for the inequality of my work that I took, I do recognise absolutely the value that it brought to myself. And it's that theme of value and the value of humanities to which I want to reflect upon this evening. Tonight also marks exactly to the day, the start of my seventh month in office as Minister of Universities, Science, Research and Innovation. A milestone which I have to admit I didn't think I'd get to uh, when I took the role up in December. And I've been especially, uh, <laughs> for only my eight days, but it's gone, all well, all good. Uh, I've been especially keen since then to highlight the role of the arts and humanities when it comes to not just understanding, but tackling the major changes, challenges we face in society today. Indeed, this has been a guiding principle to my approach to both sides of my ministerial portfolio to date, which thanks to largely binary lines in white sees me cover the higher education side of my brief in the Department of Education and the science and research and innovation element as a minister in the Department of Bates. But I've always been keen to build bridges between these two portfolios and indeed to do everything I can to bring both sides of my brief together. And that's why in my first major speech that I made back in January, I set out my own vision for a unity of purpose where I didn't just try to link up the teaching and research sides of my portfolio, but also to bring together the technical and vocational education with that which is traditionally considered so-called academic. And in this vision, I emphasize the need for people to be free to embark on the type of education that suits them at any time that is right for them. And this means embedding flexibility at the heart of the system, enhancing the portability of qualifications to allow for this step-on, step-off approach that many people in their modern working lives need. And I was convinced then that we should build bridges to make this happen. And I'm pleased now to see that my ambition to create a more fluid 
more joined up post 18 education landscape, works for learners of every age, has been reflected in what's now the so called Orga Review. And this is actually my first speech since the panel's report was published last week, and I was only right that I thank uh, Philip Orga and the independent panel for their hard work over the past year and a half. It isn't easy, I know, to be in the spotlight while working on recommendations that transform the post-18 education landscape as we know it. And I know the sector's been watching particularly closely to see what recommendations emerge about the future funding of provision. And I understand their anxieties. Indeed, even before the report was released, I made clear my concerns over initial leaks, such as the speculation over any 3D uh, off grade level threshold enter to the university. And I'm pleased to see that proposal didn't make the cut in the final report. I mean, if it had done, that would have been completely aggressive and would have shut the door on opportunity for certain people whose lives are transformed by our world leading universities and colleges. But the recommendations from the report are indeed now public and are out there. And I'm keen to work with the higher education sector over the coming months to consult on the proposals and to hear different views. Now, one of the questions I will be addressing as part of this reflection period is what the report means for the future of the arts and humanities and what it says about how we value these disciplines in society today. For my part, I've always been clear that high quality education in a range of subjects is absolutely critical for our public services and is culturally enriching for our society. But I believe that we must be careful not to confuse high quality with high value. For they are two different concepts with two very different outcomes. High quality is something which we should all aspire to, whether in our work, our research, our teaching. Many universities and many courses already are in the UK world leading. You don't need me to repeat the fact that four out of the top ten global leading universities are in the UK, 18 in the top 100, but I will. And I want to see that figure rise even higher over time. I hope that our reforms to higher education with the establishment of the Office of Students, which will be fully operational for the 1st of August this year, will help embed and achieve that focus on quality that must be continued. At the heart of the RFS's mission will be to embed greater transparency within our HE system. Institutions will be held to account for both their performance on access and participation, but also through the transparency duty that will provide more information than ever before. Now, at the same time, additional transparency comes in the form of that longitudinal education outcomes data that I mentioned, which after a decade is beginning to bring forward these tranches of data from students who graduated back in 2008. Now, I fully understand the importance of data on the returns of higher education. It's through this, I believe, we'll continue to improve and maintain the high quality and standards which we've become known for across the globe. And I'm pleased to announce that I'll be meeting formally with the Data Advisory Committee that I set up for the first time next month. However, I also understand that data in its current and existing form cannot measure everything. And until we found a way to capture that vital contribution that degrees of social value make to our society, degrees like nursing or social care, then we risk overlooking the true value of these subjects. And the same goes for the arts and humanities. Although some people around us may argue that the contributions of the dis these disciplines to society may somehow be less tangible, I believe their influence is all around us, and I challenge any critic to imagine a world without art, without music, without literature, without people who can think outside the box, or indeed challenge ideas. And all this comes from the critical thinking that knowing about different cultures and philosophies and languages provides us. It's a product of centuries-old understanding of the liberal arts and how they can shape minds 
for the future. Now, what might be low value to one man might to others represent money well spent on acquiring knowledge for its own sake, expanding one's cultural horizons, learning to empathise and to reflect upon the human condition and applying it to the challenges of the future. There is a place for knowing which subjects have the potential to generate higher salaries for the future, not least for those students who want to make sure they make the right choice of subjects and institution for them. For those who wish to know this information, it's also, I believe, important to highlight the economic benefits of studying creative subjects too. And actually, the subject isn't all negative for those studying creative subjects. The latest data shows that women studying creative arts in particular can expect to earn around 9% more on average than women who don't go into higher education at all. And the highest returning creative arts course can significantly increase female learnings by around 79%. So a creative education can certainly be the right choice for a number of people. Now, that shouldn't come as a surprise. After all, the government's industrial strategy recognises the importance of the creative sector to the UK economy as being an absolutely vital one. My government has sought to invest in that sector, providing film tax credits, for example, to encourage films such as Star Wars or the series Game of Thrones uh, to be filmed here. Now, these are fantastic billion dollar industries that have chosen the UK as their destination of choice because we have chosen to make a commitment to the arts for the present. Now, since becoming a minister six months ago today, I have sought to demonstrate our continued commitment to the arts and humanities through our industrial strategy, not just for the present, but for the future also. As I said back in January in my first speech, these subjects are the very disciplines that make our lives worth living. They enable us to think critically and to communicate. They give us a moral compass by which to live. They boost our appreciation of beauty. And they help us make sense of where we've come from and indeed where we're heading to. And that's why I set out early on that the last thing that I want to see is value judgments emerging which falsely divide sciences and engineering from the arts, humanities and social sciences. And in fact, some of you may have noticed that I even used my first speech to push the parameters of my job description somewhat. In it, I declare that although I am officially the Minister for Science, I take great pride in wanting to be the Minister for the Arts and Humanities as well. Disciplines which enrich our culture and society and which have an immeasurable impact on our health and well-being. Now, I've tried to stand firmly by that conviction. It wasn't without coincidence that I gave my first speech at RADA, one of the oldest and most prestigious centres of dramatic art training in the UK. And it certainly hasn't been unintentional that I visited several specialist creative arts institutions as part of my ongoing tour of around, I think, just over 33 uh, UK higher education institutions. In the uh, institutions I've visited to date, I've seen at first hand the value that arts and humanities can bring, not just to the students studying these disciplines, but also to wider UK society. In my first month, on the job, I spoke to technical theatre students from St Mary's University, Twickenham, who chosen to take two-year accelerated degrees specifically to allow them faster access to specialist jobs in our world-leading dramatic arts centre. I've sat down with students at Ravensbourne University to talk about their, fa their passion for the creative arts and fashion, and they've told me how their studies have opened up opportunities for them, which otherwise they simply would not have dreamed of. When I went over to Ulster University in Northern Ireland, I saw for myself how graduates of the arts are indeed supporting Northern Ireland's growing creative industries cluster, famous for its film and TV productions like, as I mentioned, The Game of Thrones, Dairy Girls, and The Fall. And closer to home in London, I met students on photography courses at London Southbank University, which lead to near 100% graduate employment. I've spoken to students from across the globe at the Royal Academy of Music, We've come here to London to study them, to learn, thanks to the world-class reputation of our conservatories. 
And most recently, I'd seen one of the UK's most successful institutional-led business incubators, which is not a scientific or large research-intensive university, as you might expect. It was actually to be found in the Royal College of Art, where it's nurturing high-value businesses and attracting a worldwide investment of nearly around about 280 million pounds. What I've learned from my visits so far as university's minister is the arts and humanities are absolutely vital to our nation's success and prosperity, not just in terms of transforming the lives of those who study them, enhancing their future prospects, but in bolstering our economy and putting the UK firmly on the map as world leaders in creative education. I can certainly see how arts and cultural humanities contribute more than the 10.8 billion gross value added to the UK economy, a figure published by the Creative Industries Federation just last month. And I can certainly understand why prospective students from around the world are looking to come to the UK for a truly world-leading education, one that embraces creativity, design, and critical thinking as part and parcel of their course. Recently, uh, we launched the uh, International Education Strategy, setting for out for the first time an ambition to ensure that we have 600,000 international students studying in the UK by 2030. And I've held many bilateral meetings with education ministers from across the globe over these past six months, most recently holding um, several roundtables uh, in Berlin, the British Council's Global, Global Conference, uh, where I met with ministers in countries ranging from Egypt to Thailand. And it's been striking to me to observe that what they most admire about the UK higher education system is not only its quality, and that is absolutely key, but its ability to produce graduates with deeply ingrained critical thinking skills. Skills which we know are the essence of a humanities education. The arts and humanities are not just powerful disciplines in their own right. They have the potential to help develop other disciplines, sectors, and industries to do so much more as well. And we should be harnessing this power now for the good of our society as well as for the future of our health and prosperity. It was exactly this sentiment that I put forward in a speech I gave a couple of months ago at a joint uh, British Academy of Royal Society to mark the 60th anniversary of C.P. Snow's Two Cultures lecture. And in that, I reflected how far we've come, in my own, how far I've come in my own personal appreciation of the different disciplines. Having started out in the arts and math, as I said, as a Tudor historian, but having had the enormous privilege in my job to learn so much more about the natural science and physical sciences as well, and specifically what can be achieved when the arts and sciences, or the so called two cultures and CP notes, how those words combine. And since I've seen the power of this myself in my own work, um, you'll probably know that my most um, recent book tells the story of Richard III and his uh, threefold role as a uh, brother protector king. Uh, I can see the famous uh, picture of Richard sort of uh, bearing down on me now. And uh, it's only through studying you know, the original manuscripts uh, in a way that historian knows how that I followed you know, Richard's life through to the bitter end where he was killed by Henry VII's forces at the Battle of Bosworth. Now, I realise that's not the only way of approaching uh, Richard's the story. Just last month from a visit to Aston University, I was lucky enough to meet with uh, Professor Sarah Haynesworth, the Pro Vice Chancellor and Executive Dean of the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, who was very keen to meet me. Um, and I was wondering why she was so keen. Um, now you're probably wondering what a Tudor historian and a forensic engineer have in common. I certainly was when Sarah asked for a meeting. But what if I tell you that among Sarah's many accomplishments is her experience in helping to establish the exact manner of Richard III's death. So after Richard III's skeleton was discovered in Leicester in uh, 2012, Sarah used her own forensic experience to analyse the wound marks uh, found in Richard's bones and in on his skull. And she was able to confirm through her own discipline that he was indeed killed by a, a sword and thrust right the way through you know, his scar the spine, the sword point touched the inside of the skull. Um, I don't know if Mike Pitts is here tonight. I know that he's done a great job writing. There we are. And, uh, Mike knows all this already. Um, but also, obviously, a harbour that came crashing down, slicing off of a flat of bone. 
Uh, and in total, uh, Sarah's team could have the Richard III and suffered 11 wounds around the time of his death, right. right to his skull and two for the rest of his body. Now, I don't think that's perhaps too much to get into detail uh, for a, bad, a, a lecture on the value of the arts uh, tonight. But the point is that while my approach on historical scholarship can provide colour to Richard III's life using documentation, it's Sarah's approach to the science and engineering that can confirm the facts and the harsh realities of his death. But it's both approaches, ultimately, that complement each other enormously. Without the wider meaningful narrative uh, that's been able to be provided through traditional scholarship in the Antiquaries, uh, Sarah's findings are just be a static fact, and a clinical diagnosis ultimately detached from the wider history of that period. Yet without Sarah's scientific validation of Richard III's death, the historical narrative and accounts uh, given by Polydor Virgil of the Crony Chronicle will remain hearsay or a version of the truth as yet unproven. So what we're seeing here clearly are two disciplines, very distinct, coming together, working in unison to enhance our understanding of the past. And it's this merger of two cultures that has absolutely enormous benefits across a whole wide range of applications in society. Today we live in a world where around 50% of the UK population have a degree by the time they're around 30. Now it's still not enough, in my opinion, and certainly not enough if we're to compete with a knowledge economy for the future internationally. And as university minister, I'm keen that no one is deterred from pursuing a particular discipline just because it appears that studying that subject isn't for people like them. It's a principle which I believe applies equally to the arts and humanities as it does science and engineering. And thankfully, one mitigating factor to this is the fact that our disciplinary landscape is continually evolving. And there can be no doubt that over time, traditional disciplinary boundaries have become more blurred and subject definitions are more elastic. As technology has developed and time has moved on, new subjects have emerged out of old ones. Interdisciplinary studies have become far more commonplace, thankfully, and multidisciplinary approaches have become more desired not just within academia itself, but by businesses, industry, and indeed government. Part of this is down to our recognition of the fact that we have to tackle the world's grand challenges now, challenges such as climate change before it's too late. And these challenges themselves simply aren't constrained within individual disciplinary boundaries. Indeed, the grand challenges we face today are formed at the intersection of those traditional disciplines where the arts, humanities, natural sciences, and social sciences meet. How can we ensure that as we live longer, we can do so well and healthily? In our ambition to tackle global warming and reduce our use of carbon, how can we adapt life around the home to reach a net zero carbon target? And as our cities become more populated, how can we sustain a transport ecosystem that is both clean and improves the mobility of the population to increase economic growth. The solutions to these challenges can only be met when we bring together our cultural, political, economic, and technological know-how. And that's why we have an added imperative now in 2019, not just to recognize the value of individual disciplines in their own right, but to see their potential to achieve even greater things when combined. I always point to the success of the UK video games industry as a case in point. When we often talk about Mickey Mouse degrees somehow, or the Daily Mail, or the that you think when you look at Mickey Mouse's success at Disney, everyone certainly thinks we should be involved in this. Uh, the UK games industry is a relatively new sector, but one which is already at the heart of UK creative industries powerhouse, generating over one and a half billion pounds for the UK economy each year. And all of this is powered by the coming together of different disciplines by the fusing together of different types of knowledge, by bringing together the best of the sciences and the best of the arts. To create a successful video game, it doesn't just take great coders and computer programmers. It takes the input of psychologists and anthropologists to understand the needs and drives of ultimately the user, the customer, the human. And it takes musicians and artists and storytellers to draw that user in, to create powerful narratives, and to make the game attractive and commercial. And that's why recently, 
Uh, we announced our 34 million pound audience for future investment in 12 groundbreaking immersive entertainment projects seek to combine the latest technology in augmented and virtual reality with new methods of crafting narratives to reach out to new audiences. And this has included an investment in Ardman and Animations, teaming up with the gaming company Tiny Rebel to produce an immersive storytelling experience which we told around key locations in my hometown of Bristol. Now, innovation doesn't just need, I believe, to happen in technology and science. The same must be the case for the arts and humanities too. But it is the joint application of the humanities with emerging technologies that will also further innovation. The big technology brands of our time have long known this, we're catching up. Take Apple, for instance. Apple's success doesn't just rest on the state of the art technology that it uses. Its appeal lies equally in its design and artistry, the physical feel of its products. And as Apple's founder, the late John Steve Jobs once said, technology alone is not enough. It is technology married with the liberal arts, married with humanities, that yields the results that make our heart sing. But the interweaving of the sciences and the arts is not just something that exists for our own entertainment and aesthetics, or for our own gratification and pleasure. And this isn't something about simply turning the stem into steam for the sake of it. The arts and humanities, I believe, can't simply just be added in, squeezed in some kind of adjunct to the sciences. I passionately believe they must run in parallel, a horizontal threat across all scientific disciplines that helps to inform, explain, and evaluate. After all, technological advance has the same subject as its form, the human. The arts and humanities are also what make science usable, and it's no good developing a cure for a pandemic like Ebola, for instance, if you don't use anthropologists, the linguists, or the lawyers to make the science work on the ground to bring a product to market, or to win the trust of the people. And at a time when trust in knowledge and expertise is constantly threatened by the lacking tides of populism, we need the humanities more than ever to be able to reach out and communicate the value of science and research more than ever before. And that also means thinking very differently about how we invest in research for the future. Now, the government is committed to investing 2.4% of uh, GDP, both public and private, in research and development by 2027. That investment would simply allow us to stand still at the OECD average. I'm like making a series of speeches on how we can achieve this target and what needs to be done to make real the scale of investment for the future. This includes investing in the researchers of tomorrow, the people who actually need to do the research on the ground, estimated at some 260,000 researchers. Now, not all of these will be in universities. Indeed, some of the examples I've used reflect much cutting-edge research is taking place in the industries of the future, the animation studios, the games companies, the tech spin-outs who we need to foster. But we need to adapt our own approach to research grants and investment in order to reflect how the modern world of research is now operating. And that's why I'm delighted that the AHRC is formally awarding the National Trust the status of an independent research organisation. This recognises, I believe, the excellence of the Trust's current research and is a major step towards the charity's ambition to embed research at the heart of all its activities. New ways of doing research, particularly by reflecting upon the merger of this event, is vital. If we're to un take any chance of meeting those huge environmental, societal and technological challenges for the future I've just mentioned. The government's industrial strategy has set out these grand challenges and tackling them is seen as key to improving our productivity and to indeed improving people's lives, not just this in this country, but indeed around the world. The first of these uh, four grand challenges are focused on the global trends that will inform our future and include artificial intelligence and data, aging society, clean growth, and the future of ability. And all of these issues are central to my own role in government, not just under my science research and innovation brief, but 
also in my new role as Paul said, as the interim Minister of State for Energy and Clean Growth, where I'm proud to lead the charge to reduce emissions, to decarbonise our economy, and invest in renewable technologies. To do all these things and more, we need the arts, the humanities, and the sciences to work together to help us seize the benefits that new technologies will bring and to help us mitigate the risks along the way. Take artificial uh, intelligence, for example. If we're going to continue to uh, push forward the frontiers of knowledge in this area, then we're going to have to work across all the disciplines, not only to enable us to unlock its full potential, but to ensure that we're developing and deploying this new technology ethically, with consideration to others and the world around us. We've already witnessed uh, in the last century the horrors that can occur when science becomes detached from the ethics and the moral compass that the arts and humanities provide, from the human experiments in Nazi concentration camps to the dropping of the atomic bomb. Post-war science has had a lot to learn the hard way from these abuses of humanity. And that's why the modern-day pursuit of knowledge must have collaboration at its core not simply to allow us to easily exchange ideas with one another across borders and across disciplines, but to ensure that principle of humanity is firmly embedded at the heart of our research, to prevent us from repeating those mistakes of the past and to make sure we learn from its lessons. And that's why I welcome actually the focus on the humanities as part of the EU's New Horizon Europe science program from 2021 to 2027. Because it seeks to embed the humanities and the role they play in scientific discovery for the future. And it's my ambition that we associate as fully as possible to Horizon Europe to be able to play our role, indeed, in shaping the future of Western civilization for this century. In the world of science diplomacy, we need to reevaluate and rethink our role on the global stage. That's why I published last month the UK's first international research and innovation strategy, setting out our own global ambitions for new research partnerships and new research collaborations. Now, these collaborations aren't simply about marrying scientific excellence and what the earth is. They're based around recognising our responsibility in the world to future, future sustainability of our planet and the development of some of the poorest countries in the world working to ensure that innovation and invention are purpose to the benefit of all humanity. And that's a mission which I believe must be an ethical one that doesn't place profit at the top of its agenda or seek to advance the power of one state above another. Indeed, instead, we seek to shape a new international science and research agenda, shaped around sustainable development goals, for a shared future prosperity, improving the condition of all human beings. And that's an agenda that has the humanities at its heart. And it's the inclusion of the humanities running like a golden thread through all the scientific collaborations and projects that will protect the future of Western science, maintaining its focus on excellence, but excellence for a human purpose. The arts, humanities, and social sciences have always been central to the way we do science in our post-war world, ensuring all the time that we understand the repercussions of the technology that we're developing, and making sure that we don't forget what happened when we abused it in our dark past. A world without the arts and humanities would not just be a sad and boring world, it would be a completely dysfunctional world, a world without progress and a world where ideas could never get off the page. A world without the arts and humanities would also be a very poor world. The creative sector is not just only a booming part of the UK economy in its own right, it's also the backbone to many other sectors and industries, providing the creative talent that brings products and services to life. And for as long as we remain global leaders in creative education, the arts and humanities are what are going to strengthen our country's place on the world stage. To ensure that we remain the go-to place for students, entrepreneurs, and business leaders the world over. And that's why, as not only the Minister for Science, but also the Minister for the Humanities, I'm determined to promote the strength of the disciplines as we move forward for the future. And I'll be doing all I can to endorse their place in our world-class higher education sector 
as well as our society at large. Thank you very much.